All right, continuing on, chapter 14 and 15. Um, so remember previously we talked about portals of entry and that was how the pathogen was able to get into the body. And by far the most common portal of entry um, is the respiratory route. And not surprisingly, the most common portal of exit is also the respiratory route because yep, we have to breathe in, but we also have to breathe out. Um, of course, you can shed skin cells, you know, um, contamination with urine or feces, um, removable blood through invasive techniques. Certainly, those are all portals of exit as well. And the same organisms that are spread, um, it, they're spread by the same portals of entry and exit in the host. Um, so, yeah, just talked about all of those. So we've already talked about latent viruses and mentioned those. Um, the one term that I want you to get off of this slide is this right here, sequelae. So what sequelae refers to is long-term or permanent damage to tissues or organs even after the pathogen itself is gone. So um, the best example of that that I can think of um, from a virus that we had hoped was eradicated um, was polio. So <clears throat> when polio was very active in populations, um, remember it attacked nerve cells of humans. And so even when the virus had been cleared by the patient, oftentimes um, you would see, you know, if you look in historical photos, there's all these kids lying in what were called iron lungs, which are basically hyperbaric chambers um, to help them breathe because their respiratory um, nerves were damaged, or you'd see kids walking with the, the, you know, you having to use braces to be able to walk. And it's simply because their nerve cells were left damaged. Um, one, some of the literature that I've read on COVID-19 suggests that COVID-19 may leave sequelae as well. So even when you're over the illness and you've cleared the virus, it appears to potentially be leaving some long-term um, damage to lung tissue um, in patients who have um, you know, overcome the virus, unfortunately. So the term reservoir, um, when, well, what we're gonna do in this section, we're gonna talk about carriers, sources, reservoirs, so the definition of reservoir is the primary habitat in the natural world from which a pathogen originates. Okay, so um, COVID-19, um, you know, we know that that's from some type of, I, I don't know if you would call it tropical rainforest environment, but it's from some live animal living in their primary habitat that was then taken out of that habitat. Um, and then that's how it was able to spread. So whatever you would term that habitat, whether it was, you know, rainforest, um, you know, Ebola is thought to have come from um, a bat or a monkey in the, the rainforest. So the rainforest itself would be the reservoir. It's a habitat. The source is going to be the individual or object from which an infection is actually acquired. So um, say, for example, there's an outbreak of hepatitis A, and we're able to determine that it, um, that it was traced back to maybe a particular um, restaurant where a particular employee was not washing his or her, her hands um, after going to the bathroom, okay? So that would be an example of a source. It could be a water supply. Um, it could be, you know, we've heard about outbreaks of, you know, E. coli or salmonella um, originating from a particular lot or a particular crop. Those are examples of sources. And then we get to um, what is a carrier. So the definition of a carrier is an individual who inconspicuously shelters a pathogen and spreads it to others without any notice. And in COVID-19, the ones that are... In, the ones that we're most worried about are this first one that's listed here, asymptomatic carriers. Um, so unfortunately, I think a lot of people um, feel that, you know, hey, I'm not sick, you know, I, there's no way I have it. Well, you may not be infected with it, but you certainly could be a carrier of it. So can you harbor a pathogen and pass it on to other people who may be more immunocompromised and actually will develop a disease? Yes, you can, and that would be termed um, an asymptomatic carrier. Um, 
And then there's all of these other types. Let me show you this next slide, which shows them in, um, you know, artistic form, I guess. Okay, so up here on the left, this would be an example of an asymptomatic carrier where, you know what, I feel totally fine. I'm going to the gym and I'm working out. You know, I have no symptoms whatsoever. But what that person doesn't know is that they actually do have the virus. Um, if it's COVID-19, you know, they have it in the respiratory tract, but either um, they are sufficiently have a strong enough immune system to not develop symptoms, um, but they're still harboring it and they can pass it on. That's what an asymptomatic carrier is. Um, let's see, incubation carrier is someone who, they're probably feeling some types of symptoms. So maybe not the full on, oh, I have a raging fever, I have a dry cough. You know, here again, I'm talking about COVID-19, but um, I feel like I might have a cold or could it be allergies? You know, they're feeling some kind of symptoms. Okay, a convalescent carrier is a person who, basically when you're in a state of convalescence, it means that the worst is over. So if you've had, say for example, um, uh, you know, gastrointestinal virus that made you vomit and have diarrhea, um, once you're in the convalescent phase, it means that you're not barfing anymore and you're not having diarrhea, but you are still not feeling 100%. So you're in the, you know, they're past all, all of the really bad symptoms, but you're still in the healing process. And could you potentially still be carrying that organism? Yes, you could, okay? That is a convalescent carrier. Um, a chronic carrier, I don't know why it's, you know, hey, I've got C. diff, wanna come over for dinner? Uh, I don't even know what that graphic is supposed to mean right there, but it's basically, they're harboring that organism all the time and they may have a low level of disease, but they're able to manage it. However, you are still able to pass that on to other people, okay? A passive carrier is one, Really, it can affect anyone, but a healthcare example is shown here. Okay, so here we have a patient who's obviously sick, has to use a bedpan, and then um, if the healthcare provider, you know, touches the bedpan and then, you know, without gloves or doesn't use proper hand washing and then goes and interacts and touches another patient, then that microbe can be spread to the other patient. So a lot of times this is how nosocomial infections are spread, you know, such as C. diff, um, where one person in the room has it, the other person doesn't, and then before you know it, now both people in that particular hospital room have C. diff. And that would be an example of pa a passive carrier. So we talked a little bit when we were in the parasite chapter about arthropods. And when we talk about a vector, most of those are um, arthropods, but they can be other animals as well, okay? So the definition of a vector is a live animal that transmits an infectious agent from one host to another. So like I said, the majority of them are arthropods. However, you know, rabies can be spread by bats or raccoons. Um, you know, depending on where COVID-19 came from, whether it was, uh, you know, a snake in a wet market. I haven't heard definitive information about whether, you know, where it came from, but I'm just using that as a um, hypothesis. So yeah, you know, it can be, but m the majority of vectors are arthropods. We can then divide vectors into two different types. So a biological vector is one that actively participates in a pathogen's life cycle. And so what that means is that it goes into and infects whatever organism it is then, you know, traveling around in, and then that organism can pass it on. Um, and I'll show you examples, okay? A mechanical vector is not infected. It's just literally picking up the organism and then passing it off to someone else. So the best examples to show you the difference between these two are the mosquito and the housefly, okay? So the mosquito shown here on the left is a good example of a biological vector. So remember, mosquitoes can carry viruses like West Nile. Um, they can carry the malaria parasite and the parasite is actually in them, it's in their salivary glands, and so they technically are infected. And then when they bite a human, 
and take a blood meal, that's how the parasite or the organism ends up in the human, okay? So mosquitoes carrying around pathogens are actually infected with those pathogens and they are inside them. And then sometimes they have to go through a critical part of their life cycle within the mosquito or in the arthropod um, before they can infect, but they're actually inside um, you know, the mosquito. An example of a mechanical vector is your garden variety housefly, okay? So houseflies, um, you know, they really don't serve any purpose. They're very useful forensically. I will, you know, help us with time of death estimates. I'll give them that. But what flies do is they um, land on things and they pick up organisms and pathogens with their gross little fly feet. And then they fly over and land on your potato salad or your sandwich or wherever. And when their feet hit, then some of those organisms drop off, okay? So in a mechanical vector, the organism does not end up inside the insect. It's just on their you know, feet or whatever happens to touch a surface. So since we're talking about animals, the definition of a zoonosis is an infection that is indigenous to animals. And what that means is it's meant to occur in animals and kind of stay there. But for whatever reason, now it's naturally transmissible to humans, okay? And so there's about 150 worldwide. Um, COVID-19 would fit into this too, but remember the, the virus that infected the first animal was different, okay? The virus had to undergo a mutation to allow it to cross over into humans. It, that doesn't always have to happen in a zoonosis, okay? It can be the exact organism. Um, the other thing that sets zoonosis apart is a lot of times the human ends up being the terminal host of the microbe. And really, I mean, the microbe wants to keep infecting and infecting and infecting and carrying itself on and reproducing. So infecting a human doesn't really do it any good, okay? If a human gets infected with a tapeworm, um, you know, most humans don't go out into fields to poop. Um, and so they're gonna get sick, they're gonna go to the doctor and they're gonna kill the tapeworm and then that's gonna be it. So it's not doing the tapeworm any favors to infect a human because it's probably not going to be passed on to anyone. Same thing with rabies. If a human gets rabies, you know, they're not going to wander down the middle of the street foaming at the mouth, you know, you know, trying to bite people. Probably law enforcement would be called at that point, but they're just going to die and they're going to die really rapidly. So um, it doesn't do the rabies virus any favors either to infect a human. So a lot of times humans are the terminal host of these organisms. But we've talked about a lot of these. So viruses, you know, whether it's rabies, yellow fever, hantavirus, influenza, because it's mutated, COVID-19 would fit in here, novel coronavirus, West Nile, um, you know, things like anthrax, the plague, which is making a comeback. We've talked about that in class, um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and then things like ringworm, tapeworm, toxoplasmosis, all of those are considered zoonosis as well. And of course, a reservoir that passes on um, a pathogen does not have to be alive, okay? We've recently talked about, um, you know, carriers and reservoirs, um, but you can also have infected soil or infected water supplies. And so if humans are in regular contact with that, they can also um, you know, harbor and then pass on pathogens even though they're not alive. Okay, 14 minutes, I'm gonna stop there. We're gonna do the last part on epidemiology and that'll be the last part of this chapter, okay? Which I know is really long, but you know, it's actually two chapters in one. Okay, thank you.